Hello and welcome to News Click. Uh, this is a very special program in which we are going to be talking about history, but of a different kind of history. History normally in India is seen essentially, especially in the last few years, as some kind of a civilizational conflict. Very recently, you had the Chief Minister of Haryana advising his advisors or his supporters uh, the best way to get into history books is by beating up protesters. We are not going to be talking about anything of this kind of history. We are instead, we are going to be talking about history in the context of a very important book, which has just recently come out. The book has been written by Thomas Manuel, and it's called uh, The Opium in Inc. Incorporated, How a Global Drug Trade Funded the British Empire. First of all, uh, thank you, uh, Thomas Manuel, for joining us on this program. I'm also joined by uh, the editor-in-chief of NewsClick, Prabhi Purakais, who is going to be also giving his perspective on, uh, on the book and also the subject matter of the book. So let me begin by asking Thomas, uh, what was the importance of opium, the trade of opium in British colonialism in India? I know that in your book, you have very succinctly put it as your central theme that the British got tea, the Chinese got opium, and Indians got colonialism. Can you explain on this a bit? Yeah. Um, so that 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 neat kind of formulation is actually from uh, the, the historian uh, Tan Chung, who was uh, yeah. Indian and Chinese origin. Um, and so the way the way that I see it is that we when we think about like the material forces behind the British Empire. We know what their major sources of income were. We know land revenue was important. Um, you know, that is kind of in popular culture. We know the salt revenue was uh, was important. Again, that's kind of like seared into like our, uh, our understanding of history uh, because of uh, Gandhi's march and things like that. But mm -hmm. at its peak, the third highest revenue source for the British was opium. And this is something that I think a lot of people don't quite know. So how, how did the opium trade arise? The way that I see it, uh, based, based, on, based on my readings, is that essentially the British had this challenge of they had, they had, they had conquered parts of India, start, starting with Bengal, uh, and that's where the opium trade also was, uh, started. was started. Yeah, But they had this problem of how to make this Indian colony cash positive like how do they make it uh, and uh, they re return on this kind of like this huge military cost outlay in in conquering more territory and maintaining this territory like how to like uh, recoup those costs and especially because they they had this they had this ongoing silver crisis so what was happening at that time was they were importing tea from china now kind of like tea at this point was a kind of national obsession for the British, uh, the British, the British government itself almost almost one tenth of its revenue at that point of time was coming from import duties on tea. There was just this huge quantity of tea that was going from China to Britain, and the idea and the problem was the Chinese were not willing to accept really like any goods in exchange. They wanted silver, and the British were at a point where almost like their entire physical reserves of silver had almost. Uh, become zero because they had just given so much of it was just flowing into China constantly. They needed something else to sell to the Chinese uh, in exchange for tea. And at the same time, they had this Indian colony, which was growing, which was not really productive in the way that they wanted it to be productive. They were looking at how do we make money off this? And they kind of looked at these two problems and they found their solution in the opium trade, which they started at a huge kind of like mass scale in what is now Bengal and Bihar. And they would, even though it was illegal in China for most of its existence, they would kind of like sell it to the Chinese. Uh, they, um, it, 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 is, it is an addictive drug uh, and they kind of smuggled it in China, forced it on the Chinese to some extent. And, and once the demand for that grew, like that was, uh, that was enough for them to continue their own tea habit. Okay. Okay. Prabir, uh, your opening thoughts on the importance of opium and its trade for the rise and the growth and the 
uh, consolidation of the British col colonialism in India. Let's take a little step back. Yeah. But if you look at the entire empire building, which came out of a handful of West European countries mm -hmm. in this period, it is really the French, the British, the Dutch, and even the Spanish and the Portuguese. Right. Now, you will see that there is a link in all of this. And the link, as Thomas says, mm. is, of course, one part of it is bullion, which comes from the loot of the Americas, right. Spanish particularly. And then it comes into the European countries through mm. Amsterdam, the Dutch actually. But then how do they get a positive balance? It comes to the balance of trade issue, mm. uh, which is also what is there currently sure. in different countries. But the balance of trade, then they had a problem because they were not able to produce anything that either China or India, the two right. largest land masses, populations, if you will, required. And they were actually buying either textiles from India and tea and other textiles also from China. So how do they balance their books? The Dutch actually started the opium trade first by, in East Indies, right. Portuguese to, to Macau into China. So the British, who by the time had got the land revenues of the Bengal uh, yes. at least area, which becomes the Bengal presidency. True. And then they were funding their military expansion through the land revenue. But they needed something else as well, as Thomas says it very succinctly, that opium... That so that is how the, Bengal becomes the first trade... No, it's interesting. Bengal becomes a trading center. Right. But it's grown really from Bihar and UP. Right. That's the area, if you see, uh, Bengal, as you know, hmm. becomes the indigo area as well as Bihar. And indigo also is something which is known historically, was hmm. also used particularly for the, this kind of purposes, also saltpeter. But the basic uh, trade balancing with China takes place to opium. And as we know, the British, as well as the Europeans, fought opium wars because they wanted to open up China. And the British were doing it for them. And therefore, the opium wars were fought for the right to sell opium to the Chinese people, while they did not sell, they in fact banned the consumption of opium, trade of opium into Britain itself. So that, that is the uh, duplicity of the British, if you will. But then we have always known British have been duplicitous in sure. their empire sure. building. So it's also interesting that the history of Western empires, the mercantile yes. empires of this period, is based on slave trade based on opium, what Throki calls addictive substances. All okay. the, it's not only uh, opium, but he also categorizes, for instance, tea, coffee, tobacco, including sugar, as essentially as addictive substances. So this is what the West European empires are based on. And of course, slave trade yeah, and you, loot of silver. Yes, you were also talking about slave trade. We talk about it a bit later. Uh, Thomas, uh, you know, getting back to your book, I... Uh, you know, remember here reading and, uh, you know, also listening to you saying that essentially this book emerged out of a fairly long article which you wrote for the Hindu sometime in 2019. Uh, right after that, there was the pandemic. So obviously there were, you know, limitations of what all you could explore. But whatever little you were able to, you know, read up and whatever you were able to research, you know, uh, uh, Prabir was talking about that uh, though Bengal became the main trading center of opium, it was essentially Bihar and Uttar Pradesh which became the uh, the areas where it was produced. But there were large parts of India also, you know, in diff completely different geographical area, the Malwa region specifically, and then the Bombay uh, became a major trading center. You know, from you in your book, you have uh, spent considerable time both on Bombay as well as on the Malwa chapters of the opium trade, if I can. Can you just elaborate a bit on it? Yes. Yeah, so the, the British had declared a monopoly uh, on opium in India. Right? They, they decided that they were the only ones that, were, that had the right to grow it. And this was before they, they had conquered all of the Indian territory, right? They were, they were just declaring this monopoly on even on lands that they didn't conquer. So they discovered um, somewhere around the beginning of the 19th century that opium from India, but that didn't come through them, was coming into China and kind of like disrupting their markets and things like that. And then they discovered that there was this kind of um, growing opium trade out of, uh, out of Western India, out of the Malwa Plateau, which is sort of like Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, uh, places like that. And basically, various kingdoms in the Maratha Confederacy at that time were uh, seeing the high price that opium was going for, was kind of like 
participating in this in this trade. And the British tried to kind of stop it at various times. I think they spent almost like 30 years negotiating treaties with everybody, trying to either become the sole buyers of all the opium they produced or telling them to stop growing it, but paying them some kind of like uh, some money to compensate for that. But eventually in about 1830, they, um, they decided that they couldn't stop this smuggling. They called it smuggling. Um, and they basically made it legal. They said, you can export it through Bombay as long as you pay a kind of transit duty at Bombay. And this is, this is huge for Bombay as a city because suddenly all this opium is going through there. Bombay becomes rich. Like all of these, uh, like Parsi traders primarily, but also like various other Gujaratis, uh, like various other like communities like are there. Um, uh, uh, there are Muslim, like there are Muslim mercantile communities as well. And basically like they, they become immensely wealthy. And that's, that's kind of like how, where I came into this. Like I was researching the Parsi trader, Jamsit G, Gigi boy for the Hindu, like you said. And when I like, and the amount of money that this man accumulated in his lifetime in the 19th century is truly really absurd. Right? We're talking about like 40 crores and things like that. At that point of time, like he becomes the first, like, like he, he becomes a full-time philanthropist. He earns himself the title of baronet. Like, you know, the queen gives him uh, uh, a hereditary title. He's the first kind of like Indian to do that. Uh, and, you know, this, this, the idea that such wealth could be accumulated in India by non-British traders to me is, is fascinating and under-discussed, right? The role, the, uh, the role of Indian merchants in, in colonization generally. You also mentioned about philanthropy, you know, uh, the JJ School of Art and the hospital, you know. The, uh, Prabir, you have also given considerable thought on the various communities which are involved in the opium trade, you know, and also the regions, you know, what are, you know, what are the uh, basic uh, issues or, or, or the uh, facts that you have come across, you know, it's interesting. You know, which is largely unknown, you know. I think it's interesting because a lot of the facts have been also airbrushed out of history because the Indian bourgeoisie also was not interested in people finding out their antecedents, just as the English bourgeoisie was not interested in finding out where Jardin Matheson's money comes hmm. from. It becomes a huge uh, business empire True. later, still today. How Hong Kong Shanghai Bank is formed. So all those yes. things are also airbrushed out of history. So you also have the Indian bourgeoisie also not willing to talk about their antecedents, and a lot of it, as Thomas uh, says, came out of what would be called the Bombay Belt, and mm. that was really initially trading. Then they branch out into different things from naval docks to steel plant, as Tata's did. But a lot of that money came from opium wealth that they accumulated, mm. and the relationship between the Indian Bombay-based industries later, and initially merchants, and the Hong Kong links are very deep. And mm. they really had even offices over there that were operated very closely. And Thomas's Hindu article that talks about, mm. talks about how it happened that uh, Jardin meets Tata. Right. And that's where it sort of, the whole thing starts from. So all of this history is fascinating uh, because also a lot of the Malwa intermediaries become also later on important as industrial houses. So I think that history needs to be... You also got to, well. you know, understand, you know, you talk about the Malwa region, you know, it continues to be a very major, you know, uh, opium growing region in India, even now where a large amount of opium smuggling and illicit trade is also continuing. You know, if you actually try to understand the historical and the social footprint of opium trade, very little is known about it in India, you know, what can we actually decipher, you know, that who were the people who were part of the opium trade, both in terms, I'm not talking only about the export, which is going on to China, but also about what was the situation as far as domestic consumption was concerned, uh, pre-British and during the British period also. You know, I think that opium was used widely, but it was never a major element in terms of what you saw in China, for instance, when you right. really mass enslavement to opium as an economic force of imperialism. So that organized difference that distributed opium use, ganja, you know, hash and all that, that's been a part of Indian culture. 
that in fact is not the major economic driver. It is the cost of opium, hmm. which is what bankrupts China and this huge flow that takes place from China into uh, Europe takes place, hmm. mainly through the British. So that is the imperialist footprint of opium in China. That is not so important in India. And let's also, hmm. what Robert says, that was also is important to register yes. that the British grew opium in the Bengal presidency, UPM. Right. Malwa, it was decentralized. It was grown locally. It was procured by intermediaries, went to Bombay for export, also to Goa, Daman and Diu, from which it was also smuggled. And Bombay... Daman became of, a major yes. port from where it went. Yes. And it, in fact, there's a smuggling from Bombay into also into Portuguese uh, ports that take place over there. Mm. But it, the impact on India, Indian people, opium as an addictive substance was not there. We already had the British. And they were also interested in introducing mm. tea in India, from which they made money. So, you know, the Im implications of all this go much deeper. How did British you know, enslave China and India? Of course, China, uh, other imperial countries were also there. So I think that's a very interesting history that we need to bring back. Because China and India, at the time that Manuel talks about, mm. were the two richest countries in the world in terms of the trade, what they produced, and what goes out to the world. If you see what's called the GDP figures, if you translate right. them, these are the two largest economies. India gets deindustrialized once cotton textiles come from Britain, and you get a reverse post-industrial revolution, but that's a lot later. That's really a part of uh, the industrial revolution, if you see, takes place in the second half of the uh, 19th century. That's a lot later than the period we are discussing at the moment. So the first part of it really comes from loot of these countries, okay. use of opium, and then, of course, the slave trade. These are the drivers of what we see, transformation of mercantile right. empires, then into industrial empires, and then reversal of trade from what was buying from these countries, selling it to Europe and other markets, and then reversal that we then get deindustrialized, and India becomes an importer of textile goods. Right. Thomas, what we are definitely seeing through the, in the course of this discussion that the opium trade, you know, had devastating effect on the Indian economy and the on, on the lives of the people of this country also. Despite that, in the 20th century, when the national movement picks up, you know, opium does not in any way cast its shadow on the nationalist discourse which takes place. If we actually look at the major writings and the speeches of various nationalist leaders, Gandhi included, we find a fairly strong position on alcohol, you know, it comes from a much more, you know, a moralistic position on, uh, uh, on, on alcohol, but it's completely absent as far as opium is concerned. Partly is it because of what Prabir was referring to as being, uh, you know, part of our culture, you know, we, you know, if we actually, I do not know about the rest of the country, but at least as far as North India is concerned, you know, this entire phrase of Afim Chatna is is very much part of everyday vocabulary, uh, you know, having, you know, licking a, a spot of opium. And it's considered to be absolutely normal in, in many sections of society, even now. Uh, you have looked at as to why uh, opium and its mention was not there within the nationalist discourse. Can you just tell us a bit more about it? Yeah. Um, yeah, like, like Prabhu said, opium was never like its ills were never really felt in India on any kind of mass scale, right? It was not a commodity in that sense. Uh, here, it, it remained in the realm of uh, like a folk, folk practices, things like that. Um, so unlike, unlike alcohol, which, yeah, the nationalist movement found used as a very safe way to criticize the British, right? Just in, some, in some sense, the fact that the British had a temperance, temperance movement going on in Britain at the same time, legitimize that you could use you could criticize the same things in India you know uh, in a in, in a way that you couldn't do with other things so and even when the so they, the nationalists discover the opium kind of like problem very late and even when they do they don't see it as a moral question right they look at that revenue and they see it in the very in a very similar logic to the British they are worried about that loss of revenue they're like we're going to become this fledgling new nation can we afford to like lose this source of revenue, are we just bankrupting ourselves on some kind of like you know some sort of like silly moral issue? And um, 
but I think, I mean, Gandhi to some extent, you know, does see it as a moral issue kind of later on and he clubs it with alcohol. But I think in the end, it is broader international forces. It's the fact that China is kind of pushing back against it. And, uh, you know, as the 20th century kind of like moves on, there is this, there is international consensus that opium is a dangerous drug and should be controlled and things like that. The, the beginning of the like the, the League of Nations and those convention things like that's essentially what uh, it's it's from there that the nationalists take their cue that they can start like talking about this issue. Okay, Prabir, I would like your views on this. You know the complete absence of opium, you know, and the negative impact it was having on Indian people and society and in the economy. Uh, from the nationalist discourse, you know, and as what Thomas was saying, you know, that national leaders were actually worried that if you actually take a position, we are, uh, if you become independent, we're going to lose this major source of revenue. You see, at that point of time, even for the British, opium had ceased to be a major source of revenue because in the early 20th century, the Chinese had pushed back. And even within Britain, there was an anti opium. There was a very strong move. Strong anti opium movement talking about China. So this, but that didn't have an effect on Indian... No, I'm coming to you. Yeah. So if you take both of this together, opium trade has falls off drastically. After okay. that. Also, there is Chinese opium coming into the market at that point of time. In they China. start growing. They start growing. So all of this put together, it became a, not a major issue for the British. But when you talk about alcohol, hmm. alcohol is a major uh, economic issue, particularly for the middle class, because they get bankrupted with the alcohol addiction, not with opium or ganja addiction. So I think there's a because economic, purely because of costs involved. I think there is a large element of cost involved because the middle class is small middle class. Hmm. If they start getting addicted to alcohol, it's a very big part of their income because it is still not really Indian made foreign liquor. So hmm. that uh, that cost of alcohol compared to their household budget was still quite large. So this addiction was seen to be an economic danger for the middle class households. Hmm. I still have anecdotal reference to my grandmother and father's talking about these kind of things, you know, uh, I'm sure so would you. So given all of this, I think it was seen to be much more of a middle class economic issue and not so much as an addiction moral issue as, you know, the others might be take, thinking about it later. What we are talking about is much later that you start getting a pushback on all of this. India signs all of these uh, agreements a lot later. In fact, now that we have de legalized, uh, we have illegalized Gaja. Yes. So there's a huge set of issues that uh, how do you really handle all of this? And while it is being now legalized elsewhere, right. so we are going in the opposite direction, so to say. So all of these things, I think the economic issue whether it is opium, whether it is in you know uh, alcohol, I think the economic issues really dominated a lot of this discourse, and they manifest itself into moral issues only because the way movements are built up later on this. No, I want to move away a bit uh, away from this central you know opium issue. And something which struck me while I was reading this book. This is something which I'd like to sound out, Thomas. Also, we're talking about alcohol, you know, and it struck me suddenly, you know, that in India there has been a fairly strong. Uh, you know, history of agitations against alcohol in various parts of India. You had, you, you know, uh, the chief minister of Bihar, for instance, very successfully running a prohibition program in in, uh, in Bihar. Uh, you talked about, uh, Praveed, that how alcohol has affected the middle classes. Uh, Thomas, this is something, you know, purely as, as from one journalist to another, one writer to another. Any ideas to actually look at this... Uh, in a slightly more broader perspective in future, let, yeah. Let yeah, me please. Before Thomas yeah. comes in. I was yeah. talking about Gandhi and the national movement, yes. when it's the middle class issue. Yeah. Now it's also the issue. Of it's the also poor. the working class. It's also the working class, also the poor, because with Indian made foreign liquor, as well as the, the Desi liquor, that is a much bigger issue. And let's not forget, it's industrial scale production, while all others are still not industrial scale production. Right. Therefore, they're decentralized. So that makes so that's why it become, that's why it's become a more you know economic a bigger issue. economic issue. Yeah. Yes, Thomas. Sorry, sorry Thomas. To no, no, I, 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 I no, I think to some extent it has always been a, a working class issue because, like, not not just alcohol, but all of these uh, addictive substances. Right? It's the 
it's not just the British who like learned how to use them. There is this sense of say plantation workers, right? Like uh, you, there is this like centuries long practice of plantation workers that you hire them, they are forced to do kind of like backbreaking labor and to kind of dull the pain of that backbreaking labor, you sell them alcohol, opium, things like that. And then you charge them for it. You dock it from their wages. And at the end of the month, it turns out that they're in debt to you rather than you having to owe them a salary. So there is this long tradition of using addictive substances as ways of like extracting uh, like value from like working class people. Yeah. I think uh, that's very important also when you come to West Indies, for instance, the Caribbean, yeah. because that was also the True. role of molasses and uh, rum. rum. And yeah. that whole thing, all cycle is also there. So I think that's a very important element mm. that this is a way of also enslaving, quote unquote, the workers. But Manu, Thomas, plantations are new. So they really come with, with colonialism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is not older than that, the cycle of plantation and plantation yeah. workers. Uh, we have to also start winding up this discussion and I do not think, uh, Thomas, it would be very appropriate on our part to uh, not talk about opium in the present global context, you know, especially because of the centrality of uh, opium and, uh, you know, the, 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 the crucial issue which is there in the world, that is that of terrorism at that particular, in this uh, current situation. So would you Tell us as to how you see uh, the opium trade globally now. I know that we are all aware of how Afghanistan has become a major center of illegal opium production. And how is it uh, looking ahead? Yeah. Um, yeah, like you said, I think the understanding is that currently Afghanistan is responsible for about 90% of illegal opium production. And... Uh, opium is the raw material for drugs like heroin. Not, not all opioids are derived from opium. Okay. They, many of them are synthetic, but uh, heroin, for example, is one uh, that is. And yeah, I think the, like, like over the last 30 years, the key areas of where opium has been produced and has been kind of like integrated into terrorism, global kind of organized crime, like has shifted at one point, you know, they call, used to call it the golden triangle, which was near Thailand, uh, Myanmar. Uh, and then, you know, they used to talk about uh, the golden uh, uh, near Iran and places like that. But yeah, now, now it's Afghanistan. And there is this sense that that kind of arose out of the vacuum that was left after CIA and kind of like American funding left. Okay. Yes. The Thomas, I'm going to interrupt you here. Yeah. Because the rise of actually opium accompanies the American incursion into yeah. Afghanistan. In the 80s. I'm talking about much more recent than that, post to the, the post 2000. Post 9 11. Okay. Because they support the warlords who were very yeah. much into opium trade. So, so it actually stopped it in its first in phase. In its first phase, first yes. The warlords. So the resur resurgence of opium that we see internationally and from Afghanistan comes from uh, because of American policies American through, policies through in the last American twenty years. Support upon American support to warlords. Right. It is basically blessed by the Americans as a cheap way of controlling Afghanistan and alliances, local alliances, they're forced there. But I would like to go back even earlier. Yeah. When you talk about Thailand and those areas. A lot of it was out of the Vietnam War. Right. Because again, the CIA's yes. involvement exactly. in all of this drug trade is there, as is also the narco trade in Americas. You know, the other, other part of it is, in fact, when you talk about opiates and uh, Thomas referred to it, right. the opiate issue today has also shifted to the drug companies. I'm not talking the, of Coca-Cola. The, the pharma companies. Pharma companies. Right. I'm not talking of Coca-Cola here, who initially also sold cocaine, right. mixed it in Coca-Cola, yes. it is said. But it is that's why it was named for possibly. <laughs> okay. But the point that comes up is the fact that it is also the opiate crisis in the United States because this industrial scale production of opiates. But so therefore, this becomes a much larger issue. But let's be very clear. Yeah. Afghanistan, both in the at the time of what was called the Soviet incursion, the 1980s, 1980s, when Americans and and, and the last 20 years, 20 years, the Americans have been deeply impl implicated 
and blaming Afghanistan without taking cognizance of this would be wrong. So, so we are seeing, you know, a continuity that in the 18th and 19th century, it was British imperialism and now it is American imperialism, which is behind the globalization of the opium trade. I, is that the right way of saying it? I would say yes. And the other part of it is it cannot be fought in the way this is talked to be, it's being fought. We have to think of different ways of looking at how to fight addiction. And I think that's a different discussion. That's a completely different, different discussion. thing. That's not something we can have today. Uh, your concluding uh, comments, uh, Thomas, on this, what Prabir has said, you know, especially about and how we concluded by saying, you know, that imperialism to a certain extent has been behind the widespread nature of the opium trade. Yeah, I think uh, it, the sort of the cloak of secrecy that kind of shrouds the American intelligence agencies makes it hard to talk about these things. But yeah, undoubtedly, you can see their fingerprints in so many uh, of wherever opium is involved in the modern day, for sure. So yeah, it is. And like Prabhu said, there's a question of like how generally like these drugs are thought of today in terms of like the medical paradigm of seeing them as addiction and then criminalizing it, mm -hmm. uh, especially in India. Like in India, there is a certain amount of opium that can be legally produced. And yet, um, we still sort of like are, we have, we have some kind of epidemic uh, in places like Punjab and things like that, which has been kind of like handled extremely badly. Yes. A lot of people like find themselves in jail uh, without any kind of like recourse for long periods of time. So yeah, th there is, this is a, also like a justice issue. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, having participated in this discussion. Uh, congratulations on your book and wish you the best luck for it. Uh, thank you, Prabir, also for uh, you know being very illuminative in these in this discussion and coming up with very sharp points. Uh, I hope that uh, you have enjoyed this discussion and found it particularly enriching. Thank you very much.